When you're a data scientist, you want to test the impact of a particular model and see how well that performs. So that model is the intervention or the quote unquote therapeutic that you're using to assess. Developer relations is actually more of an umbrella term than a single role. Within DevRel, you've got community managers, you've developer advocates, evangelists within this umbrella term. Llama index, I think is a lot better for retrieval augmented generation, whereas LangChain is really good for just uh, controlling flows of language models. So I was talking about how I'm doing all these LinkedIn learning courses and writing a book and all this stuff, right? I'm not like a pre-existing expert on any of these topics, but I asked myself, okay, if I want to become an expert, if I want to be recognized as an expert, then what activities should I engage in that would help me get there? The core message I want to say is just fall in love with learning and get comfortable not knowing stuff. This episode is brought to you by Training Data. If you're new in data science and want to get into the field, or if you're already in the field but want to progress, well, Training Data is the platform for you. They offer courses on feature engineering and selection, model tuning, interpretability, and much more. You will get both the math and the intuition behind each method, but also Python codes ready to power your own projects. So if you're interested, visit the link in the description and don't forget to use the code AI stories to get a 10% discount. All right. So hello everyone and welcome to the AI stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer. I'm a senior data scientist and I will be your host. So today our guest is Arpreet Sahota. Arpreet did a master in math and stats at Illinois State University. And after that, he worked as a biostatistician for five years. He had a bunch of other experiences, but um, a couple of years ago, he actually joined Desi AI, where he is now a deep learning developer relations manager. So in this episode, we're going to talk about Arpreet's career, about computer vision, about Gen AI and RAG, and much more. So if you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe to the AI Stories YouTube channel, comment, share, and leave a five-star review. All right. Hello, Arpreet. Hope everything is going well. First thing I want to ask is tell me a bit more about your story and how you got into the world of data science, AI, deep learning. How did you get into the field? Uh, well, I got into the field uh just through mathematics, I guess. That's honestly how I got into the field. Um, like a long time ago, back in like 2008, I was actually a math teacher, high school math teacher. And at that point, uh, I was living in in California and there's, um, you know, budget cuts happening. Teachers weren't making as much money. And I asked myself, okay, with this love of mathematics, what could I do that will make me some good money? And that's when I learned about this career called actuarial sciences. And so that's what I kind of set my, my eyes on was actuarial sciences. Um, and I pursued that uh, as a career. But, you know, I left, I left my undergraduate years with a uh, not a very good GPA. Not, you know, I wasn't a very good student. Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't dumb, but I just wasn't a good student. Um, so I ended up having to retake a lot of classes. Um, somehow, I, you know, even even not being a good student, the state of California thought that I was good enough to be a teacher. Uh, but um, I had to actually go back and retake a lot of classes. So while I was working full time as a teacher, I went back to community college and I started from the ground up with like literally, you know, trigonometry, pre-calculus, calculus one through four. Uh, then I went to UC Davis and did more advanced math and statistics. And, you know, for about two years, I was working on prerequisite math courses just so that I could get my GPA up to a high enough level that would allow me entry into grad school. So that coupled with like, you know, pretty good score on the GRE, um, I think like 97th percentile on the math GRE, uh, got into um, Illinois State University, which at the time, I pursued because there was a professor there whose work I had been using a lot for um, studying for actuarial exams. So he'd written a bunch of manu manuals on actuarial exams. And you know, I figured I might as well go to school there. And it was one of the, the top schools for actuarial sciences. Uh, so that's what led me to, to Illinois State. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what got me into this field initially was, you know, I wanted to become, I started with the love of math. 
uh, pursued that love of math to uh, become an actuary and, you know, kind of have navigated this career since then. Actually, like, it, it sounds always sounds weird to me. You know, people say a career in data or a career in, like, you know, in data or whatever, break into data. Like, to, I, I don't know why, just that, that phrasing never really made sense to me. Because, you know, there's when I think of like a career in data, I think of somebody who's like managing databases or like a DBA mm -hmm. or a data admin. I don't think of somebody who's doing quantitatively rigorous work. Um, but that's just as an aside. Uh, but that's kind of what led me, you know, the, the early steps to where I am now. now. Now, granted, like, you know, it's been 10 years, over 10 years now, 10 and a half years since I left grad school. And and um, it's been a winding journey uh, to now. But yeah, that's initially what got me to where I am now is just this love of mathematics. Can you define the word actuary for someone who comes from a European um, yeah, yeah. background? So an actuary, I think, is a really like a, 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 the truest sense, a, a data scientist, because we're, you're using data to come up with insurance policy pricing, essentially, at, at the core of it. That's what it is. So whenever you go and apply for insurance, whether that's health insurance, life insurance, car insurance, whatever, um, when they take your data, your personal data, your history, and they enter that into a system and you get a, a particular rate, uh, all those, the, the equations in the background, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, were all crafted by actuaries. Um, so that's, okay. you know, okay. if you're paying a lot for insurance, you have, you know, act, you know, <laughs> actuaries to, not blame, but you know, that's, that's how, who's arriving at your, your rates. So basically you love math, you do your master in maths and stats to get into the field of data science, and then you work as a biostatistician. Is that right? Is that your first job after your master? No, I was an actuary uh, for about a year and a half after okay. after graduation. Um, so actuary is actually like, you know, actuarial sciences. And for this career, you actually have to take a series of examinations. There's 10 examinations that you have to take in total. Each examination is um, you don't get to use anything more than just a regular TI calculator, like a, a small TI calculator. Uh, the first exam was like a it's an exam on just mathematical probability, so calculus-based probability. So you're doing probability theory by hand. The next exam is financial mathematics. Another exam is uh, mathematical statistics. Then you have uh, another exam for uh, pricing of um, options and inequities and things like that. And you know, th I, I love that type of stuff. I love doing that work. Um, but then I met my uh, at the time she was my she's now my wife and now the mother of my kids. Um, but I met I met this wonderful girl. And she lived here in Winnipeg, Canada. And um, though she also went to grad school in Chicago, uh, and I was living in Chicago, our paths never crossed. Um, she was studying uh, optometry and moved here to, well, she's from Winnipeg um, and moved back to Winnipeg after optometry school. Uh, and, you know, at, at the time, it just made sense for me to pursue a life in Winnipeg just because... Uh, just because of circumstances. And at the time, um, the only kind of job opening here was uh, as a biostatistician. And so now biostatistician is actually very similar to actuarial sciences because an actuary really is a statistician, right? And a biostatistician is in the name, it's statistician. So the skills were transferable in the sense that we use the same technology. Like I use a lot of SAS, S-A-S, and, and I needed to make use of my quantitative, you know, statistics kind of of knowledge um so it, it wasn't too much of a stretch to, to become a biostatistician but i did that out of necessity to move into canada from the u.s um because i was here on a work visa and once i got to canada like i'm a u.s citizen but even then i had to deal with that kind of issue to work in in canada uh, and i stayed in that job for about five years since that's how long it took to get my permanent residency um, I wouldn't necessarily say biostatistics was like a passion or anything that I was like deeply mm -hmm. interested in um, because it was very, it was very rigorous work, uh, very statistically rigorous work, but there was no like prediction, no machine learning. It was more just actual, like actual statistics. Um, I'll, I'll pause okay. there. I know I kind of rambled on a bit there, but. Yeah, no, interesting. So can you maybe just high level, give a high level view of 
the math stats or data science work that you were doing uh, as an actuary and as a biostatistician? Like, what's the kind of thing involved, data science stuff involved, and how do they differ? It's more data science than what actual data scientists do. Like, it's really, really advanced statistics. Like, you know, as, as an actuary, uh, trying to come up with warranty pricing models, it's, it's all probability and mathematical statistics. Uh, moving into biostatistics, it's, it's all clinical trial statistics. So you could think of it as A-B tests, but we just call them multivariate tests. Um, you know, let's say that we have, as you know, the, the thinking just from the perspective of a biostatistician, in order for a drug to get approved by a governing body, you need to show evidence that this drug is actually efficacious and it actually is, is safe. Um, and so behind the scenes, like, you know, I'm working closely with a clinical trials uh, scientist, usually a PhD, in, you know, PhD scientist, and we're designing an experiment. Like, okay, we have this therapeutic that we want to want to give to people. Um, how do we, you know, figure out which groups of people get dosed? How do we randomize the trial? Um, how do we design this experiment? Um, you know, how do we get the right sample size to control for power and, you know, the, to, to make sure we get that significance level that we're looking for? Um, so it's a lot of that kind of work, right? So really, really pure statistics, um, which I think is more rigorous than what I've seen most data scientists do, really. Yeah, I think that's an interesting problem, actually. So you, you've got a drug and you want to make sure that it works. And so A-B test, basically, you give the drug to 50% of, you choose a, you choose a population, you give the drug to 50% of the population and you don't give the drug to, or you give a placebo, how does it work to the other 50%? And then you compare the result to check if the drug worked or not. Basically at a high level, right? There's a lot more, <laughs> there's a lot more nuance with how you design the experiment and how you randomize people to, to the, the groups. But you'll start with, uh, you'll have, you know, a placebo kind of group and you'll have lower dosages, right? So you, it, it depends on the drug and how you're going to do it, but you might have uh, a study where you're, taking a a um, kind of a, a, a placebo, taking the competitor drug in the market or the current status quo and then the new therapeutic, right? And then trying to see, okay, which one is, you know, is there equivalence between our drug and the therapeutic? Uh, is our drug better than, you know, the, the current therapeutic? Or you might have a, um, a design where you have uh, increasing level of doses. Um, so things like that. Mm -hmm. So it gets really, really nuanced and complicated. Um, but yeah, a lot of lot of experimental design. Yeah, can you go into the challenges? Actually, I think it's a very interesting problem. I used to do A/B tests in mm -hmm. in my previous company. So, what are like the common challenges, the things that you had to think about when designing such an A/B test? I haven't done this in like five years, right? It's been a long time since I, since I was a, a biostatistician. Um, uh, but the biggest thing is getting the sample size right because mm -hmm. you need to find the right sample size and you need to control for statistical power uh, as well so that um, the significance level you achieve is, is actually meaningful. Uh, in a nutshell, that's like, you know, what it comes down to. And I think okay. that Make remains, con you know, constant with even like uh, A-B testing in like, you know, tech world, right? Um, I think A-B a -B testing in tech world is kind of more, more simpler uh, in because you just route people to different kind of uh, endpoints, so to speak, and see which one performs better. Um, but when you're dealing with human lives and you know drugs that interact weird in body, it becomes more more nuanced. Um, yeah, it's a bit, it's been literally so long since I've done that work that I just I would encourage people to just pick up a book on on uh, design and analysis of experiments. Um, I, I still have that book there on my bottom shelf somewhere um, <laughs> and and check that out because that's, you know, it's it's a rich, rich, deep topic, like to the point that there are textbooks and entire graduate level courses written written about this. Great, great. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting topic and quite a, I mean, people think of data science and machine learning as training models, but A-B test is also a big part, um, not just in biostatistics, but also yeah, in any field, uh, I was working in a 
credit company and we used to do quite a lot of a b tests to check whether our models were actually performing well or not so yeah it's really something that's done a lot in industry i think in marketing and in recommender systems it's also done a lot so definitely a cool topic yeah what's interesting about that is as you know from the perspective of of a data scientist working with with a with models um the analog to that in biostatistics is this right like uh when you're a data scientist or machine learning, whatever it is, like you want to test the impact of a particular model and see how well that performs. So that model is the intervention or the quote unquote therapeutic that you're using to assess, right? Uh, whereas in you know clinical trial statistics, that that intervention that there it's, it's actually a therapeutic, it's actually a drug. Um, so it's very very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just there's a lot more. Uh, regulation involved and the the bar for showing that you're you know like your work gets reviewed by statisticians mm -hmm. at the at the at the government level right and you have to get clearance from from regulatory bodies so the bar is really really high to prove that your thing actually works uh, but it's the same exact thing whereas you know you know the credit monitoring or whatever it was the credit company thing you're talking about like the intervention itself is a model that you build so you build some model, you build some intervention, and you know, you're building this intervention based on previous data that you've observed, and then you're then taking that intervention and then uh, deploying it and kind of guessing or measuring the impact of this intervention. Um, likewise in biostatistics, except that the intervention is not done by you, the, the biostatistician, it's, it's conceived in a lab. Right. And so you'll have different phases of a trial. So you'll have like animal trials. So um, the company I worked at primarily, we worked in um, the niche was uh, like kind of rare diseases. So we had, um, you know, for example, we had a antitoxin for botulism. Um, we had some drugs that uh, were a Zika intervention, um, the Zika virus. And then there are some drugs for... Um, uh, something called the the Christmas Christmas disease, which is uh, has to do with um, bruising and, and hemoglobin. Kind of, you know, if you get bruised and you're not able to recover, you get a lot of internal bleeding. So very rare diseases and early stage trials. Um, so a lot of animal trials um, as well. Um, so definitely, definitely interesting, interesting work, um, and it's just radically different than you know deep learning. I think, <laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I don't miss it. I don't miss that work, to, to be completely honest. Um, uh, I love technology too much, and I'm, I'm glad I've kind of found where, where I am now, but uh, rigorous work, uh, yeah, hard work as well. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's talk a bit about deep learning then. I mean, you so you worked as a biostatistician. You didn't love it from what you just mentioned. And then you had a bunch of experiences, but in the end, you ended up joining the CAI a couple of years ago. So yeah, do you want to talk a bit about how you joined the CAI? Maybe some interesting things that you did between biostatistician and DESI? Um, yeah. And how there's you joined a, the company? It's a pretty big gap between biostatistician and, and DESI. I think there's almost five year gap between that. Okay. Um, so after I, you know, after I left being a biostatistician, I, I worked at an e-commerce company here uh, in Winnipeg called Bold Commerce. And I was a senior data scientist there. Um, and so there, that was kind of more of, um, uh, I wasn't building machine learning models, um, but I was, you know, a glorified data analyst, I guess I would say, but I got to, I got to work with technology and I got to, you know, work at a tech company that was cool. Uh, and I worked there for about a year and then moved to another company here local to Winnipeg called Price Industries, where I was the lead data scientist. And there I got to do like actual machine learning and ML ops work. And, um, then that kind of moved more into like data management, data governance, because it turned out that I couldn't really do good machine learning or good data science because of the state of the data in the company. Um, and that's when I realized, oh man, like, you know, this high level data, data governance, data management, data strategy type of stuff definitely is important, but it's not for me. It's not fun to me. It's not interesting to me. Like I love, I love, I love being hands-on with technology, right? I love coding. I love tweaking models and, and working on that type of stuff. Um, but then kind of, you know, right around the same time uh, that I was at Price Industries is when I started my own podcast and 
at that podcast, um, The Artist of Data Science, like I got a sponsorship from Comet ML. And Comet is a um, experiment management platform um, for, for machine learning practitioners. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up uh, getting a job there. Uh, you know, they, they've been sponsoring my, my podcast for about almost a year at that point. Uh, then they're like, hey, we got this position we think you might be a good fit for. And uh, it was a developer advocate type of role. Um, and that's kind of what um, was my break point or my entry into this world of developer relations. Uh, so I worked at Comet for a while, um, then worked at Pachyderm for a little bit before moving into into Desi. Um, so it was a, b- a bit of a you know a long road, but um, yeah, I've been in DevRel for um, almost two years. Almost two years, yeah. Okay, so can can you talk a bit about Desi and what's a DevRel? What's your job mm-hmm. there? Like, what does it mean to be a DevRel? Yeah, so I'll start with first what is DevRel and then then talk about Desi. But d- developer relations, um, so it's not a new role by any means, right? DevRel has been around for as long as there's been software for developers. Um, it just so happens that over the last few years, there's been a lot more companies that are building developer tools for uh, practitioners in machine learning and data science, right? So the role, um, developer relations is actually more of an umbrella term than a single Mm -hmm. role, right? So much like data science is an umbrella term, right? Within data science, you got data analyst, data engineer, business business intelligence engineer, so on and so forth, right? You got all these roles. Um, Same thing with DevRel. Within DevRel, you've got community managers, you've got developer advocates, you've got evangelists, you've got you know other roles within this umbrella term, and really the 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 point of having this role is, you know, if there's a company out there that builds tools for developers to use, then this company should have a a way of keeping pulse on you know, checking the pulse on developers in the developer community, um, getting feedback for the products, testing products before they get into the hands of developers. So really the developer relations professional is kind of in between the company and the community, right? So my role at Desi, um, so so Desi, we're a developer tool company. We've got a number of different things. One thing we have is an open source library called Super Gradients, which is a computer vision training library. Another thing we do is we build models, generative AI models, and we push those out there as, as well as computer vision models. Um, our core technology itself is, um, a co- you know, the open source library being one of them, but um, the real bread and butter technology we have is a proprietary neural architecture search algorithm that we can use to build models for clients. And then we have this runtime called Inferi, which is a... Uh, um, kind of a competitor to VLLM, um, you know, just makes it easier and faster to run inference on generative AI models. Um, so my role here is, okay, we, we build these new models. Uh, I need to first test the model, um, you know, experiment with it, play around with it, document how my experience has been using this model, communicate this back to the research and engineering teams, um, and iterate with them, um, you know, to improve either the experience or the model's performance. Uh, and then once the model's at a point that is ready to, to be released to the world, I've got to create a bunch of uh, content or, you know, to educate people on how to use it. So I'll write notebooks that will showcase how to use our model or how to use our libraries um, and to get the word out there. And I'll, I'll create a lot of projects using our model or our library um, just to to get the word out there. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is, I'll, you know, obviously the community management for sure, but then also speaking to people who are using our products and using our models and getting their feedback. Um, but, you know, more more importantly, like, you know, for example, with the generative AI models that we released, you know, we just pushed a seven billion parameter language model called Desi LM seven B that ended up topping the Hugging Face uh, Open LLM leaderboard. Um, like nobody's gonna really take it upon themselves to uh, compare this model to other models mm-hmm. in real world applications. 
Um, so I create reproducible kind of notebooks that say, okay, take this notebook and here are all the steps. Like I'm comparing our model to Mistral, right? And you can run the same notebook. You have my code, reproduce my experiments and see for yourself how the model performs. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. I'll pause there to see if there's any other questions you might have. No, yeah, I think this kind of answers yeah, most of most of the question. Um, so basically, two main things. Like first, you test the product internally to make sure that what the developers in the at the C are doing is actually um, well, the model are performing well and also solve real world problem and are uh, easy and good. Well, easy and mm -hmm. simple to use. And then once you've got a good solution, you then market it you build something that works well and you show it to the community first of all so that they use it but also to get their feedback and make sure that the product that you've built is actually um, something that the community likes yeah exactly so kind of like with the with the new model that we released desi lm7b like you know i spent a few weeks red teaming the model right so i would uh, give adversarial prompts to the model to see how it generates or i'd give the, the, the model all sorts of different prompts and see what the model does and document the experience uh, give it back to the research team or I'd you know I'd take that model and I'd fine-tune it on downstream tasks and see okay can this thing be fine-tuned uh, how well does it fine-tune um, so yeah exactly what you what you had said there as well and so what are the different kind of products that you've got so you've got models that's one thing you're building models and your goal is to have the community use those models or use your platform as well you've got also something else you mentioned neural architecture search um, and ways to train um, train LLMs faster or have a faster inference so yeah what kind of products do you have as with you know any developer tools company you know most of the time when you're putting out stuff in the open source world it is a way to kind of get brand recognition right like mm -hmm. even even mistral with their model with their yeah. mixtral model they put out it was a marketing ploy to raise awareness for the platform right uh much in the same way we do the same thing where we'll release a model uh and we'll open source it um as a way to raise awareness about us as a competitor and in, you know us as a player in the field mm -hmm. Um, so that's one aspect of it. We release open source models to hopefully attract people to our product uh, to see how well our product works and then see if they'll be able, you know, if they'll be interested in, in whatever our paid offering. So um, that being said, the, the actual product itself, one of them is called the Auto NAC engine, NAC, Neural Architecture Construction. It's essentially a neural architecture search algorithm. Um, so using deep learning to build deep learning models. Um, so that's that's one aspect of it. That's one paid product that we have. So we have a lot of customers who, um, let's say, your machine learning engineers build a awesome model in the lab. You know, on whatever GPU you're building it on, it it works great. Uh, everything's going good. But you try to go to deploy it, and that model's latency is you know too long. That model, maybe it doesn't even fit on the device that you're deploying it on. Um, there's challenges, right? And to a certain point, maybe your internal team can handle some of these challenges through quantization, pruning, you know, these different techniques. Um, but if eventually you end up hitting a wall and you're not able to ha build a model that meets the service level agreements of your deployment environment, um, that's kind of where Desi AI would step in and say, okay, cool. Let us give us a sense of, okay, you don't have to give us your data, but give us the characteristics of your data. And so for that, uh, when I say characteristics of data, you can take a look at our other open source library called Data Gradients, which is a kind of a data profiling tool for computer vision tasks that will, you know, we'll use exactly those summary statistics and, and that, the profile of your data to inform the model that we build downstream. And this model will take into consideration, okay, what hardware are you deploying it on? Uh, you know, is it a Jetson Nano? Is it a A100? Like, what, what are you deploying on? We consider that. Uh, we also consider whatever service level agreements you may have. And by that, I mean, okay, how fast do you need the model to perform inference? Um, what are the constraints of that kind of environment that we need to adhere to? 
Um, so we take all this into consideration, and then using our algorithm, we're able to um, find the optimal architecture, the optimal neural network for that specific deployment environment. So that's that's kind of our bread and butter tool. Uh, then the other tool we have is um, uh, the inference engine Inferi. Um, and Inferi, uh, with this we have, um, we've got like just, it's essentially optimized CUDA kernels um, and a bunch of optimization tricks uh, so that the model that, it's definitely tailored more towards DESI models, but we have support for Llama and Mistral and, and other models. But essentially, it's taking a model and uh, bumping that inference speed and, and that inference uh, capacity uh, to its limits. Okay, so making like one limitation of Gen AI is I, I've been, I'm used to use uh, GPT-4. And one limitation is it's quite slow, right? Um, if you, yeah, need to write a report or whatever, it, it can get quite slow. So your model and your tool makes it much faster. Um, I mean, not GPT-4 because it's not open source, but would the inference be much faster then? Yeah, pretty much. That's that's exactly what it is, right? Like if you have like a model that, you know, you're using uh, in your own environment, for example, you got a model that... Um, you're not using OpenAI model, you have your own custom inference server, right? Um, and maybe you tried VLLM or takeoff and it's not, the inference, you know, latency is too long. It's taking too too long to make predictions. Um, then you can use our SDK, our inference engine, and those predictions will ramp up quicker. Um, so in the case, like we, we, we compared um, our uh, uh, DeciLM's inference with Inferi compared to like Llama and Mistral on just VLLM, and I think it was like an 8x speed up in in tokens, tokens per second. Okay, whoa. So yeah, quite. And VLLM, is it the, I'm not really familiar with it. Is it open source? And what's the mm -hmm. difference yeah. between your tool and VLLM then? Yeah, VLLM is an, is an open source inference engine. Uh, the difference, okay. um, the, the big difference is, you know, our engineers put some proprietary CUDA kernels into our inference engine, we've optimized beam search, and we've done a number of other tricks that just make those matrix multiplications happen um, a lot quicker. Okay, cool, cool. And then on the neural architecture part, just moving back to this, um, yeah, how does this work exactly? So you mentioned you, you're you using deep learning to generate the best architecture. Is it some kind of, are you trying lots of different architectures for a specific problem and seeing which one works best or how does this work on a high level? No need to go into the, the details, but I'm curious to understand how this works. So <laughs> the three things you need. Okay. So the so definitely go and check out this blog post that we have, desi.ai forward slash neural architecture search, right? And so there's three main building blocks that you need for neural architecture search. One is the search space. So this is like the, and the search space is nothing more than like the uh, different operations that can happen in a neural network, right? Convolutions, uh, activation functions, uh, ReLU, things like that. You know, the typical type of you know, operations you'll see in a neural network. So you design your search space, and then from there you have a strategy to traverse the search space. And so the search strategy involves uh, particular metrics that you want to optimize, right? And uh, you use this to explore the search space. And then once you've done that, then you have like an evaluation strategy. Um, so uh, definitely check out the blog, Desi AI forward slash just neural dash architecture dash search. And it'll give you like a, a good thorough overview of, of how neural architecture search works. But those are three key elements that you need. Search space, search strategy, and evaluation strategy. Um, and actually, I, I talked about this um in detail as well on John Crone's podcast, Super Data Science Podcast, uh, the most recent episode of that that I was on as well. Okay. And and is that the, did you use NAS to build YOLO NAS? I've heard a lot about YOLO NAS, this algorithm that I think Desi built uh, in right. collaboration with, with other people. So is that what? Uh, yeah. So, so n not in collaboration with anyone. We built that model uh, completely okay. internally uh, in-house and uh, the NAS part of that YOLO NAS means that 
uh, we discovered this architecture using our algorithm. Okay. And mm -hmm. can you, for the listeners who aren't familiar with Yolonas, like, can you explain what it is and why is Yolonas a, a good algorithm? Yeah, so Yolonas is uh, uh, an object detection model. Um, so it's an object detection model. We bill it as kind of the um, first kind of foundation model uh, for object detection. Um, and so this architecture uh, we discovered using our um, proprietary engine, the AutoNAC engine, and then mm -hmm. uh, we trained it. Um, we did extensive pre-training on Object 365 and then on Coco as well. Um, and so it, it was done in a semi-supervised kind of fashion. Um, and it's uh, the current state of the art for object detection. Um, so uh, I'll pause there and see if there's any other questions, but yeah, um, that's essentially what it is in a nutshell. It's an object detection model that's currently the uh, state of the art. Okay. No, great. Yeah, I think I, I've seen a lot of things on LinkedIn about Yolonas and how good it is. So I will link an article in the in the description, but looks quite a cool model. And I think it shows that NAS actually makes model better. Yeah, yeah. It's, um. yeah, definitely we can go uh, go, uh, go more into it if you'd like. But um, but yeah, it's uh, available through the Super Gradients Training Library. Um, you know, the model weights are there. And uh, I've, I've written a lot of uh, tutorials to help people get, get started with it. So uh, definitely, definitely check it out. Great. Um, okay, so the main two products, if I summarize from Desi, is uh, NAS, this neural architecture search to build custom optimized models for, um, well, for specific uh, deep learning problems. And then you've got this uh, inference, it's inferi, right? This inference engine for LLM, which helps your LLM be faster, have a faster inference. Um, yeah. I want to move on to Gen AI, which is, I mean, strongly related to Desi AI. I know it's also a topic that you're very interested in. Um, so yeah, let's dive into it. And the first thing is, well, how did you learn about Gen AI? How did you get into this field? What are the resources that you would recommend? Yeah, tell me a bit your story about Gen AI. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've kind of really, really went uh, hard in, <laughs> into Gen AI just this last year. Uh, last year, meaning, um, you know, 2023. Uh, you know, we're now in 2024, but that's when I really started getting into it. Um, and I, I, for me, it just, it started with just um, with chat GPT, to be honest, right? Like, because before that, like, I didn't really... I didn't really mess around with with many generative models like at all. Um, ChatGPT came out and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing! And it started with kind of a an interest in um, in prompting techniques and prompting strategies and how to get the most out of that. Um, and that's kind of where my headspace was at first. I was like, okay, can I can I like you know what can I do with prompting? Like how how cool is this thing? Uh, and then from there, eventually, it started getting more hands on with code. It just started reading a lot more kind of research papers and and saying okay there's like these models on hugging face how do i use them and just started really getting hands on uh with stuff so for me it was a lot of um a lot of self learning uh at first um just kind of hacking around really that's what it came down to i started with some um tutorials and blogs from from hugging face um but then kind of towards the middle of 2023 is when i really started getting way into it uh and through that process, um, it was fortunate that uh, Desi had made kind of a, a I don't want to say pivot, but we put our our foot into the generative AI pool, so to speak. Um, and so it became part of my job to kind of learn mm -hmm. more and more about generative AI. Um, and then really the, the thing that really helped me learn was uh, these cohorts. I started joining with AI Makerspace. Um, so AI Makerspace, that's uh, Greg Lochnane and Chris Alexiuk. Backtrack a little bit. I had initially seen their work, Chris Alexiuk and Greg Lochnane, through, um, I believe, his fourth brain. So I went to some fourth brain webinars, saw that these guys had started their own thing, and I joined their cohort for LLM Ops, uh, which is a four-week cohort. And that's kind of like really where I started to, to learn more and more. Um, so in terms of learning resources, AI Makerspace, for sure. Check them out on YouTube. They've got a ton of great videos, uh, great learning styles. 
uh, sorry, great teaching styles. Um, and then also deep learning AI has probably uh, my favorite resources because they're just, sh there's short courses. The short courses are amazing. Um, so I'd highly recommend those. Okay, cool. And then what's, what are the kind of tools that you use then to play around with LLMs? You mentioned once you learned about it and yeah, understand how it works, what are the tools that you like to use? Uh, I primarily find myself using, um, well, the hugging face transformers. Um, you know, that's, that's obviously, you know, a key component to my stack, uh, but also lane chain llama index. I, I use those uh, a lot. Um, I've got a course coming out that will be coming out. Um, I think sometime later, uh, this quarter, uh, early 2023, uh, with LinkedIn learning, uh, this is prompt engineering with, with lane chain. Uh, I've got a book, uh, well, I've got another course with LinkedIn learning, uh, called retrieval augmented generation with llama index. And then I'm writing a book with Wiley publications, um, on, on the topic of retrieval augmented, uh, generation. Uh, but primarily my, my stack is, you know, obviously open AI, um, using their models, um, hugging face for the open source models, uh, llama index and, um, uh, uh, lane chain. Yeah. I've used line chain a bit and yeah, really recommend it. If you want to quickly build an app, uh, I know llama index is also really good. I haven't used it yet, but if you want to quickly build a chain of LLMs or any kind of LLMs quickly, um, I think line chain, yeah, makes it just very easy to, to build something. Um, you can build very cool products, chatbots, um, generating mm -hmm. reports, um, chatting with a data uh, in with some SQL or Python language. So, so many use cases that you can easily and quickly build with, with Langchain. Llama index, I think is a lot better for retrieval augmented generation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the persona that Llama index kind of caters to um, is more like, you know, the data engineering kind of aspect of AI engineering. Whereas, um, Lang chain is really good for just uh, the the orchestration of, of language models and like controlling you know flows of language models. Um, their their rag work is is definitely good as well, but I, I think Llama Index really excels uh, for 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 rag. Okay, so Lang chain is more generalized. You can build more stuff, and Llama Index is really good. If you need to use rag, then Llama Index is the tool to use. Yeah, they have a lot more support for more kind of uh, advanced uh, RAG mm -hmm. applications and evaluations and, and things like that. Um, but both can play well together uh, as well. Um, but yeah, they're they're both okay. I think good tools uh, to to learn, especially in this kind of new generation that we're in, this generative AI generation. Yeah, so I'm I'm keen to dig a bit more into the two topics that you mentioned, so prompt engineering and and RAG. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for prompt engineering first, let's start with this one. What would be your tips to write a good prompt? Um, yeah, for people who aren't too familiar with it or even for people who use Gen AI often, what would be your tips to write good prompts and get what you need out of the Gen AI? Prompt engineering is definitely a lot more than just like entering prompts into a uh, into a UI because there, you know, there's mm -hmm. actually... There's more prompts that, that I mean, there's more actual engineering work than just kind of entering the prompt in. But uh, from the perspective of just writing a good prompt, um, uh, you know, clarity, you know, make sure that, you know, you're clear as possible with the way you're phrasing stuff. Because um, the more clear your instructions are, the more accurate the model's response is going to be. Um, ask for structured output where you need it, right? Um, so just define kind of the format that you need up front. Um, where possible, use few shot prompting. And few shot prompting is meaning you're giving the model a few examples of of the task. Uh, so example and like output, example, output type of thing. Set good conditions, right? So, you know, if you want really accurate responses for that query that you're sending to the model, then just specify some prerequisites, right? This is going to help the model kind of generate outputs that are going to align with the criteria, right? So, you know, b before asking kind of that main question, just provide some necessary conditions for, for example, you could start by saying something like, you know, if X is true, then what is the answer to Y, right? Mm -hmm. 
iteratively refine your prompts, right? Um, avoid overloading the prompt and yeah, keep track of your, your prompts. Yeah, good point. And yeah, I think I agree based on my experience. Um, the first thing I want to say is many people think Gen AI is magic. And so you should understand that if as a human people, a human, if a human cannot understand your prompt, the Gen AI algorithm will not understand it either. Like it's not magic. So you really need something very structured with, uh, well, all the information needed. If there is a context, you need to put the context um, and all the information required to allow the LLM to answer the question. Otherwise it's not going to work. And then also from my experience, I'm, I've built quite big prompts and the advice I would have is, first of all, try to not make it too big. But if you have to make it big, make it very structured. Like as a human, um, if you've got random bullet points everywhere, you're not going to understand it. Whereas if you have something very structured with clear, um, as you mentioned, make it clear with clear explanations of the things that the Gen AI has to do, well, this will help a lot. So definitely agree with you. And then the last point is Langsmith. Um, yeah, I fully recommend it um, because it's so good to keep track of all your prompts. You can check out earlier versions. You can also understand like basically the inference time. Sometimes I have bugs with um, a few runs and the inference time is much longer and you can directly see this with Langsmith and you understand that there is a bug. Um, and yeah, it just helps you keep track not only of your prompt, but also all the inputs on, on your prompt. So yeah, definitely recommend it um, if you don't want to, yeah, if you want to keep track of all those things. Um, yeah, that's the main thing I think for for prompt engineering. Uh, the second topic is RAG. It's probably the last topic of this discussion. Can you explain a bit what RAG is? How does it work? And why is it even so popular? Yeah. Um, so I guess we could start with kind of the motivation uh for rag um so i i think as if you've played around with uh, chat gpt for example enough you might notice that the answers that the llm generate might be um inaccurate right mm -hmm. uh that's because llms can suffer from you know this uh, hallucination problem right also sometimes the information that's relevant to you might be beyond the scope of what the language model was trained on, right? Um, and also, language model, model itself might not have access to like the latest information, right? And so this is kind of where retrieval augmented generation comes in. Um, and so how does retrieval augmented generation work then? So it's essentially combining uh, retrieval systems with generative models. So instead of kind of the model being solely you know reliant on its internal training data you can have the model kind of query an external database for relevant knowledge to assist with generation right um and so it, this involves really you know we have a corpus of trusted data right we take this trusted data we use an embeddings model to turn it into vectors we then store those vectors in some vector database and then at query time, we take the user's query, we embed the user's query using the same embedding model uh, and use some type of similarity search to fetch the relevant documents from our database to then inject into the context window of, of the language model. Um, and so this system then you know, fetches the relevant documents, injects into the context window, and then the language model takes this entire context and is able to reason about it, for, for lack of a better word. Okay. And, and companies will so why would you use this? Companies would use it because, for example, if they want the LLM to answer company-specific questions, for example, about um, whatever, how the company works or uh, customer support stuff or things like that, the LLM wouldn't know it. Um, if you take uh, ChatGPT, for example, it wouldn't know about uh, your personal company and um, what your company is doing. And so you would use company specific documentation and you would kind of augment the LLM with company specific knowledge, right? Yeah, exactly. And so if I understand well, there are two parts. The first one is the embedding where you embed the documents into a vector database. And then the second part is the retriever 
where you retrieve the right documents or the right chunks based on the questions. Yeah, so just kind of, I guess, break down the entire pipeline for, mm -hmm. for RAG, kind of the basic RAG doesn't involve any end-to-end -end training of a language model, right? We'll just stick with, with basic RAG right now. Um, so it's just, it, it needs an indexing and a serving pipeline. So that means you need to kind of create a data ingestion pipeline. So a way to kind of continuously uh, update the data that's exposed to the language model. Um, then you need data storage, uh, and then you need an embeddings model, and then finally a vector database, right? So these are things that you need, um, and you need to define some or construct some different uh, components. At a high level, maybe five components, I'd say. An indexing pipeline, so a way that you can index data into the vector database. Uh, then you need a querying pipeline, so you need to transform the user's query to an embedding so that you can search for the relevant documents in the database. And then you need a retriever, so a way to extract the relevant documents from that external source uh, to provide context to the language model. Okay. Um, and then, you know, there's um, document selection kind of techniques, right? You want to filter out less relevant documents um, and make sure that you're giving the best context to the language model. <clears throat> and then finally, you just contextualize this for the language model. Um, so at a, at a high level, that's kind of the system design for, for Ag Pipeline. Okay, so if you if we start with embeddings, why can you explain maybe why we need to transform the text into an embedding and into numbers? Why is this needed, and why don't you just take the the raw text? Um, because it's easier to compute similarity between vectors than it is to compute similarity between words, text, okay. like actual actual letters and numbers and stuff like that. Um, so that's that's the the key point. So you have, you know, an embedding models that will embed your tokens and embed your documents, and it just makes it easier, more efficient to do vector search uh, with this. And so, what are then? So once you've embedded your document and you've got your vector database, what are the good techniques that can be used to make sure that we retrieve the right part of the documents, the right part of the questions? I'm guessing there are different techniques that people can use. Um, yeah, what are the common ones? Um, yeah, uh, there's different retrieval techniques that you can use. Um, you know, parent document retrievers, I think, is probably uh, the good... Well, I mean, there's first things, a few different things you need to consider, right? Like, first is how big chunk size you have, right? And then and then from there, like, the actual selection technique for, for those documents. Um, you know, parent document retriever, I think, is... is um, uh, a good one to use coming up a lot. I, I haven't had time to delve too much into this yet. Uh, re-ranking, um, some way of re-ranking documents, um, as well. So you know, the, the, this is a, this is a kind of like the the core component I think of of RAG is trying to figure out which documents to actually select. Um, so yeah, uh, your parent parent document where it's like okay, let me. Uh, you have a chunk size. You take your query and you. Uh, identify a smaller chunk of that text and then take a window around that and inject that into mm -hmm. the context. Um, a number of other number of other techniques as well. Um, yeah. And, uh -huh. and so by re-ranking, you mean first the retriever selects a series of candidate documents and then you have a re-ranker which re rank those documents to get the most relevant one to the LLM. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, basically it. And, okay. And the reason for this is obviously we don't want to pass all the documents to the LLM because that's too much context and it's not going to answer the question well. Yeah, some of it will be irrelevant, right? Like mm -hmm. you might get a hit mm -hmm. on a document just because it matches some keywords okay. in the user query, but it's not really relevant to the entirety of the question that the user is asking. Okay, okay, perfect. So yeah, let's just finish this with one advice. Um, I want to move to yeah, the career side of things. If you had one advice for people to progress in their career, what would it be? Just one advice. Um, just learn, like, <laughs> like learn as much <laughs> as like, not just learn, but I guess what I mean to say is, um, 
fall in love with learning um, and just be comfortable not knowing stuff. Um, like I was talking about how I'm doing all these LinkedIn learning courses and writing a book and all this stuff, right? Like it, that I'm not like a pre-existing expert on any of these topics, but I asked myself, okay, if I want to become an expert, if I want to be recognized as an expert, then what activities should I engage in that would help, you know, me get there? Or if, you know, what would an expert already be doing? And then let me go do those things. Um, so a lot of this stuff, like I'm not an expert in rag yet, but you, you know, I'm going to become one through the process of creating all this, you know, this body of work around it, um, and immersing myself in it. Um, so yeah, just, I guess be, be comfortable not knowing something at a start at the start, fall in love with learning and just go, go do it. Right. Like I have a tendency to sign myself up for like highly visible projects before I'm ready to even do them. Uh, and like in the most public arena, do like uh, I'm writing a book for Wiley and I'm creating courses on LinkedIn learning. Like these are pretty public, highly visible activities. Um, but then that kind of keeps me accountable and uh, helps me, um, I guess, motivate, motivate or yeah, I guess motivates me to, <laughs> to, to learn this thing as well as possible. So I guess that's the core, core lesson. Just take on things, embark on activities before you even feel ready to do it and just get ready through the process of doing. Fake it till you make it basically. Yeah. But I, I don't, I really, I don't really like that, that term, mm -hmm. like faking it. Right. You just, you just, you know, just think, think about how cake gets baked, right? Cake, it doesn't go into the oven fully baked, right? It comes out fully baked, but it goes in as batter. And throughout the process of sitting in the oven, it turns into <laughs> this fluffy cake, right? Uh, the cake isn't faking it. It's just transforming itself uh, by ex being exposed to heat, right? So much in the same way, you want to do the same thing. You want to transform yourself by exposing yourself to a number of different things. And in the process of this exposure, you will become something else. Yeah, love the analogy. And I also think I agree it's good to put yourself accountable of something. So force yourself, show yourself. Um, for example, having a course on LinkedIn, I release this podcast on YouTube and everywhere. It's good to do a side project for yourself alone, but you will have more pressure and we, you will be more motivated and you will want to do really well if you know that um, you're going to have to show your product to other people and deliver something for other people. And so I think that's a uh, Yeah, that's quite an important thing. It's good to do a side project alone, but try to also go out of your comfort zone and really put yourself out there because that's where you're going to progress a lot, I think. Yeah, yeah. And not to give anybody the wrong idea, like that's not the only way you you can mm -hmm. um, you know, transform yourself or, or push yourself ahead. Um, you don't have to go out there and do these public things like that you and I do. You could, you, you could just do small things just do things at work right and and then and, and take those on or or just do it for the sake of doing it just you know the the the, the core message i want to say is just fall in love with learning and get um get comfortable not knowing stuff and just because it sucks like like it does like it's a bad feeling when you go try to do something and you don't know the answers or or you know you, you end up you'll go on a podcast and you can ask questions and it's like oh man i really don't know the answer to that but then that's that is a signal to you about what you need to go kind of learn and, and figure out. Um, so I think you take the discomfort as signal. Um, so yeah. So it, everybody sucks at stuff at the beginning, right? Like it just, it's part of it. Like it's just what it is. Like, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to do your first project, you know, at work for rag and it's going to end up being amazing you learn through the process. So just, yeah, act, act, I guess is, is the many key me messages I'm trying to send here, but just act, just, uh, just act, just do. Well, thanks a lot, Arpreet. It was great to have you on the show and get to learn from you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me. Thanks for uh, tuning in everyone. Thank you.